the experience for the end consumer is poor and therefore there's low levels of engagement. It's typically what we see in pension industry around the world. Um, the experience lags, I mean, even behind banking by like 10 years, 15 years, which is like... You're right. The I, banking both my pensions yeah. in the UK, exactly. I, I, I can never ever get to know what the value of that pension is like. It's like yeah. a nightmare. Exactly. So, yeah. And, and there, there's there's value in that for them because they don't want you thinking about it. They just want to keep the assets, make money off of you and, and everything else. We're building an institution with a with a startup mentality. So we want, you know, we're, we're building a corporation. We're not, we're not just a startup who's here for a few years to do something shiny. Um, and break everything. We're here to break the way that things are done, but deliver it in, in a way that is long-standing. I want to welcome you to the second season of Couchonomics with Arjun. Join us this season as we go beyond fintech and payments and embark on the journey into the future of financial services, a future which will be shaped by existing and new developments in technology and innovation, including and not limited to the likes of embedded finance, open banking, ESG, various versions of metaverse, decentralized finance, digital currencies, and other trends. On the couch, we're going to have the most influential and progressive-minded founders, executives, investors, regulators, innovators, and industry commentators from across the MENA region and beyond. Join us as we unravel a multitude of layers of the financial services industry and try to learn how technology will continue to impact the world that we live in. Couchonomics with Arjun is proud to collaborate with some of the most respected and innovative names in the world of payments, fintech and technology. Ardian is a reliable end-to-end -end payment solution that provides innovation and flexibility to help businesses achieve their ambition faster by turning payments into a strategic growth driver. Get everything you need with To You, a Saudi-based super app for delivery, mobility, on-demand services, and a lot more. Tuyu you connects you to everything you need to enrich your daily lives by building an ecosystem across its end consumers, merchants, and reps. Visa is a world leader in digital payments with a mission to connect the world through the most innovative, convenient, reliable, and secure payments network to enable individuals, businesses, and economies to thrive. GDA is a leading fintech and payment solution provider founded in Saudi Arabia, expanding rapidly across the region with established operations in UAE and Egypt. GDA's vision is to empower merchants with the tools to start, manage, and grow their business. M2P pioneers next-gen fintech through innovative offerings across payments, lending, and banking landscapes. Their comprehensive tech stack powers end-to-end -end banking services, BNPL, customized credit cards, prepaid cards, and more. Welcome to today's episode of Couchonomics with Arjun. I guess by now you know who I am. That's Arjun. Joining me on the couch today is uh, actually an early stage founder. And as, as some of you might remember, when I actually started this season, I had pledged that, you know, four out of the 40 odd episodes I'm going to do this season are going to be with early stage startups. Uh, you've had a few of them already uh, published. Uh, joining me today actually on the couch is Michael Watkins. Michael is founder and CEO of Orem. Uh, Orem is an employee benefit platform. Uh, we're going to get into what that really means shortly. But before I do that, Michael, welcome. Thank you, Arjun. Good welcome, to be here. Welcome to the couches, as, I, as it's, usually. It's very comfortable. It is, thank you. <laughs> and I'm sure you'll enjoy it. So, so you know, thanks for making it. Mm. And, um, you know, we met, I think, what, a few months ago at, did, a, at, yeah. a, at a coffee shop uh, where, you know, I first heard about what you were doing. Mm -hmm. I think we had a good conversation. Uh, as always, I didn't add any value to you, <laughs> but you were kind enough to spend 90 minutes or, 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 or however long. It was a lovely coffee. Thank you. Uh, thank you. So, Michael, let's, let's start with, I, I think, the first question I think for the audience is, you know, what is Aurum? So, I mean, there's probably a history to this. So Aurum started out as a retirement solution. As we know, there is no retirement provision in the UAE. Uh, at least it isn't prolific. And we intended to solve that problem very distinctly, focusing on that problem. Um, from speaking to customers and, and being out in the market, we realized actually 
because there is no prolific solution in the market, there is very little interest also in a pure retirement solution. Um, so we, we kind of decided to cater to other problems that businesses and their employees were having around provision of employee benefits. So whilst retirement is still a big component of what we do, we also put, provide a range of other financial services that important is to support employees in, uh, in, in making more of their money. Okay, and, and what are those? Because I do want to get into retirement yeah, for, for a sure. second. Uh, I have a point of view on that too, mm -hmm. uh, and I'd love to run it past you, but what in addition to retirement savings covers uh, the overall portfolio that is currently being offered? Yeah, so like I said, we're financially focused. So we offer end of service gratuity management, we offer incentive plans, so effectively like a deferred bonus. If you know if you want to incentivize your employee to stay, you may offer them a, a lump sum of money that they can access over a period of time. We offer savings plans, which gives people access to institutional funds. Again, something that's really important in a market that's now very saturated with investment products. Um, and we are also going to be launching a salary advanced product uh, in, the, in the coming months. And so if I understand that correctly, while you're serving the end employee, mm -hmm. your route to market is employer. Exactly right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So we've taken kind of a traditional approach. I think it's it's uh, always a question that gets asked around, you know, why don't you just go direct to consumer? And I think there's definitely an opportunity to do that in future. Um, but right now, I think the biggest distribution opportunity is through the employer. It's really hard, especially in a market like the UAE, to access, you know, a significant number of individuals. Okay. So let's let's go into where we actually started. And I think that might allow for, I guess, this typical sort of question around the mm -hmm. genesis of Orem and where yeah. it came from. You, you mentioned that the problem you wanted to solve or you are solving is was around a retirement solution because there was no prolific offering. Right? Correct. Yeah. So let me give you my sort of naive view to this, mm -hmm. right? And this is where I, my thinking came from. I agree with you that uh, retirement solutions is not, uh, as I, as we consultants call it, a revealed demand. So mm -hmm. it's not there are no people standing on top of buildings and you know, you know, uh, 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 passing slogans around. <laughs> I need something for my retirement, right? And, and the reason for that, or at least I thought the reason for that is the following, right? One is, uh, I don't know how many people actually retire in this part of the world, mm -hmm. right? Um, secondly, um, till very recently. It was a very transient population, yep. right? Uh, people used to say that the average time uh, an individual spends in the UAE ranged between sort of two to five years. Mm -hmm. I have no idea how that's shifted. I'm, I'm assuming it's it's longer now. Yeah, right? nine, to ten, nine to ten years on so, average. So now. that's one so, yeah. shift. And, and, and we used to follow that because in my past life, I used to work for a conglomerate which had a very large uh, automotive market, mm -hmm. uh, had a large percentage of the automotive market. And, and we used to always look at what the average duration of an ownership of a car was, yeah. because that impacts how the car sector. The third thing was there wasn't much of, if I may call a market of products and solutions where your savings could go into for longer term wealth generation or wealth protection. At least that's my sort of point of view, right? Uh, and, and I'm sure there are some other reasons added to it. And obviously, for people who are locals, the you know the government has certain programs which they provide for the local population, right? Yeah. If you pull all of that together, it doesn't surprise me that you know there isn't much of a retirement uh, market. Now, please tell me I'm wrong. <laughs> so I think um, I mean I'll add to your point before I before I answer your question. So I, I did a talk on this recently. Um, Interestingly, for 99.9% .9 of the human existence, we haven't lived past the age of 35. So there's a behavioral factor at play with regards to retirement. So people literally can't see themselves living past 35. If you think about being a kid, you know, you, you, you may have thought to the future maybe about you know, having, having a wife, having some kids, getting married and, and, and having a house, but you don't really envisage, envisage yourself being 65. So you have a, there's a behavioral barrier that people have in the first instance, That's very interesting. Which, is, which is something that we have to tackle. Um, but to your point, I mean, people are living here longer now. Um, and more generally, people are living longer. So there is an inherent need to provide an income when you stop 
working. Like nobody wants to work forever, right? I'm sure, I mean, you're a hard worker. Uh, I, I think of myself as a hard worker, but we don't want to do this forever, right? That's that's just not in our DNA. Um, so ultimately it comes down to how do you create a one-to-one -one ratio of, uh, of income replacement? Because because that's ultimately what you need, at least for a good period of your retirement. Uh, you know, Typically retirement would be 25 years. It's now going to be 35, 40 years. People are living longer. Yeah, yeah so if you're, if you're working for 40 plus years and then you're retired for 40 plus years, where's, where's the money coming from? And I think the problem that we're trying to tackle is how do you remove that behavioral barrier, but also help people, you know, plan for the future, have, have a, a solution that can kind of, isn't delivered in the, in a traditional way. I think that's the most important thing uh, as we see it. Okay, but talk to me a little bit about not delivered in the traditional way. Yes, yeah, so I think uh, if you look at, so again, I'll give you a, a, just a brief history on my background. So I've worked in the retirement investment savings industry for over 20 years, okay. um, developed products and worked in markets around the world. And there are definitely strengths to markets. So for example, uh, the, um, Australia is often used as an example of a good retirement system. It's auto enrollment, highly engaged audience, people saving. They still have a problem when it comes to retirement with people not spending enough money, interestingly enough. So even when they do have enough money to, to live comfortably, they don't spend because there's this kind of short term mentality again. So um, the way that I see things are that, you know, you do need an element of nudge to kind of get people saving. Otherwise, they won't. But what you want to do is kind of make it more short term as well. So savings should be thought as kind of almost like seasons through your life. Right. It seems like a very obvious thing to say. Mm -hmm but a much harder thing to implement. So um, again, like another factor will be the number of financial products that we have to think about today. You know, if, if we go back to our parents' generations, they may have had a mortgage, a bank account, maybe a savings account. Today, I mean, again, uh, I don't know your personal situation, but you've probably got about 20, 20 accounts or products that you're using for managing your finances, which is incredibly complex. So what we're trying to do is simplify the process down to a few distinct products that are actually useful for you deliver them through your employer. And the reason for that is because you don't have to think. You get your you get your salary from your employer. If you can direct funds straight from your salary into your bank account, there's kind of a barrier that's removed. If the money goes into your bank account and it has to be paid out, there's there's a barrier to that. You know, I, I might want to spend it on a nice meal rather than saving for the future. Whereas if it's, you know, in the same way that tax systems work in other work in, in other in other ec economies, um, it happens automatically. And I think that's a really useful mechanism uh, for for creating a savings culture. Interesting. So you open three doors for me. Mm -hmm. I'm going to walk into all three in order. Yeah. Uh, they might not be the right order, but that's the order in which uh, I, I'll pose the question. So. The first question here I have for her is, is there's no doubt uh, and everything you've quoted is factually true. So I'm not going to challenge any of it because it would be stupid of me to do that. But we're predominantly an, uh, an expat population, right? And, and most people who arrive here tend to arrive here for employment reasons, mm -hmm. right? So they don't typically come here for education. So they, they, you know, they might have worked somewhere a few years and you know they find themselves either an internal transfer or they apply for a job or yep. whatever else it might be right so there is the, so 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 a lot of them don't actually come here thinking about this place as home in terms of the long term which basically means and I'll take myself as an example right so I'm ethnically indian I'm a brit uh, I have mechanisms uh, uh, if you might call them long-term saving mechanisms, whether mm -hmm. they're pensions or uh, in the US, the 401ks or whatever, back in where I came from, mm -hmm. right? How do you get people to think differently to say, no, you want to use the mechanisms here in a country where you are for a, for a short period of time? Yep. And again, portability is not the concern here, mm -hmm. right? It's it's about, as you said, the nudge, right? The nudge exists for me back in the UK. Why wouldn't I just continue to to just furnish whatever I need to in the mechanism out there mm -hmm. versus starting a whole new mechanism here, right? While maintaining the one back there, because at the end of the day, there's a very high probability I'm actually gonna land up back at, back in my home country, if I want to call mm -hmm. it that, at an age which is closer to my retirement. Yep. So I think there are a few interesting things here. So um, a, a stat that I often refer to is globally, there are 270 million expatriates. 
okay. which is the fifth largest country by population. So if you think about that, like just in terms of the pure volume of expatriates that currently exist today, post COVID, that trend is increasing because of mobility, um, uh, more freedom of movement, I guess, more freedom of movement between people. So to your point, I think there is a process of this is my home, this is where I have savings, this is where I plan to retire to. But I think there needs to be a blurring of the lines. And you know, you, you mentioned the point around portability, but if I was to dream up an ideal world, you know, pension systems would, would have more freedom of movement. Um, not just pension systems, but as, you know, the, the, the allocation of assets and, and how you're, they're accessed. And I think you, you touch on another point, which is, you kind of said the word pension because I said the word pension, but you also referred to it as a, you know, other savings mechanisms. Mm -hmm. And I think removing those mental barriers of it's this product or it's this product and thinking it more about wealth creation, because that's ultimately what we're trying to do, right? Mm -hmm. You're trying to reduce the amount that you spend, increase the amount that you save or invest. Um, and I think, again, that mental model is much friendlier for people to be able to understand that it doesn't matter where the assets sit, especially now, again, with the rise of robo advisors and investment platforms where you have access to investments, you know, in the US stock, stock market, the Australian stock market, wherever, wherever you want to invest, um, the, the mindset is shifting, I think, towards it's now just where is my money saved? Where's my money invested? How do I access it in, a, in an effective way? Um, but I think there still needs to be an element of planning. And you're seeing that shift even happening in the expats who are in this part of the world. Yeah, I mean, so people are, people are staying here for longer, right? So I think increasingly people are wanting this to become home. The UAE is, is shifting its policies to make it, uh, you know, a, a place to stay, come work, live and retire. And I think we all know it's, it's the cost of living here is still high. Um, you know, things like uh, health insurance that are provided by your employer. If you have to pick that cost up yourself, all of a sudden there's a multiplier that you hadn't previously had to, to, to think about. So I think there are, there are shifting, shifting mentalities with people that are living here now. Um, and I think that will continue. I mean, let's be honest, the UAE, UAE is a beautiful place to live. People may not want to spend, you know, the rest of their days here, but when it's, you know, I come from London, right? So uh, the sun doesn't shine there every day. <laughs> so do I, but I do miss London. <laughs> yeah, exactly. London has a charm, right? And I think, again, back to the point, people are becoming more dynamic in their movement. So you might want to spend three months in London, three months in the UAE and, you know, six months somewhere else. And I think increasingly there is the ability to do that. So you need assets that can be accessible in multiple places that can give you that freedom of movement but also afford you that opportunity and i think that's that's the big thing interesting yeah. so second door which uh, i want to walk into uh, employers mm -hmm. right um so i've been you know i've been around uh, in the middle east for about 12 13 years right it's a long time mm -hmm. uh, i think i'm i'm twice the average or maybe not twice the average anymore but at least 20 30 percent more than the okay. typical sort of uh, uh, expat who comes in um he, here's my view on the employers and this is not based on any data any facts this is, could be completely wrong right most employers in this part of the world have wanted to keep their relationship with their employees as simple as possible, mm -hmm. right? Uh, we, 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 we have a requirement of particular skill set. You go to the market, you sort of hire that individual, right? That individual works for a period of time, gets paid a certain salary. Uh, now, obviously, there is end of service gratuity and so on and so forth, which, which you know, the government has enforced. And, and they tend to sort of keep the relationship to that level, right? Mm -hmm. uh, it's not you know, people talk about retention being very critical to employers here. Unfortunately, I think there's a lot of lip service out there, but that again, might yep. be right. Now for your business, as you said very, very correctly, there is, there are several needs. You need to build awareness, right? That there is prolific offering, Absolutely. right? Yeah. You've got to create the nudge, mm -hmm. right? You have to have the mechanism, which I'm, you know, which needs to sort of kick in that, that saving every week, every month, yep. right? Uh, and then there's all kinds of sort of record keeping, reconciliation and so on and so forth, right? And the employers are playing a very critical role along this entire journey, mm -hmm. right? Is there a shift among the employers? Are, are, they, are they keen for such products? Are they embracing this or give me an honest opinion, you still find that it's a uphill task with the vast majority of them? 
Yeah, um, I'll always be honest. And and I think it, it, it's definitely an uphill, I think again, there are multiple facets here, but it is an uphill struggle because um, as you said, <clears throat> the employers have a relationship with their employees. Um, they probably feel like they do and spend enough and there's always economic pressure, especially in you know the current environment. Uh, so they, don't necessarily want to take on extra effort or cost to provide their employees with, you know, additional benefits or value. So I, I think that's the first thing. I think the second thing is increasingly what we're seeing as though the, the population of expatriates is increasing here and, and there is you know, an ever growing dynamic workforce. The quality to create a thriving environment isn't the same as it would be in London, in Singapore, in New York. So I think there's a growing realization that, you know, there are things that need to be done to encourage people to come here, work here, stay here from an employer perspective. Mm -hmm. And then I think ultimately the thing that's worked really well, well around the world is regulation driving this change. Like, let's be honest, like, it, whether you're an employer or an individual, you're still a person and you're not thinking for the long term. So having saving for an employee who may or may not be with you for the long term is not top of mind. Mm -hmm. So you do need that push from a regulatory perspective. And I think the paradoxical thing about regulation is it's a great enabler but it can also be a, a great blocker, right? <laughs> so you, like, as you know, like there's uh, more regulate, like, regulation just gets built on top of rather than being removed and, and rethought of. So I think, again, the opportunity for the UAE is like, you know, use regulation in an innovative way, use it in a meaningful way, give, give that opportunity for uh, a shift in the dynamic of how these, these solutions are delivered here versus how they're delivered in other countries. So, so I, I, I will come to regulation because I know that there are certain things and certain shifts which have happened which are very favorable for the industry and, 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 and you in particular and, and I guess your peer group. But it, it's staying with the employers, right? I've got another sort of view here and maybe I'm, I'm wrong. Uh, I think a lot of employers are also very worried about you know, the reputational risk mm -hmm. of offering products which are longer term rather than transactional in nature, For sure. right? Uh, I think they're easier, they're happier giving you a discount card which you could use with 10 mm -hmm. stores which give you a 10% off, yeah. right? Then say, you know, here is a mechanism that we as your employers are offering through a third party where you can take your, your savings and, mm -hmm. you know, most people here tend to have one source of income right, because of the environment here, it's, you know, very few people have multiple sources of income in yeah. this part of the world, right? And so therefore, and if let's say goes, something goes wrong with that platform or the, or, or the underlying funds within the platform, yeah. because you, you, know, you guys are also working with a, a wide bouquet of, of sort of providers, yeah. employers just don't want to deal with that, that, that headache. So, mm -hmm. and I'm not even talking about the cost side of it, right? Oh, yeah. I, is that a conversation which comes up again and again, uh, or because a number of these individuals in, I guess, the finance and HR functions who you interact with understand, so therefore there is a growing acceptance that, you know, this is not a reputational issue, this is becoming a necessity? Short answer, yes. Um, I, I think that there is a risk aversion to, to, you know, this perception of taking on more responsibility as an employer and then the impact that that will have on their employees. But I think one of the things that we've seen through conversations with employers is there is, whether they like it or not, more of a symbiosis between the employer and the employee than they care to admit. So, you know, several employers are already providing financial aid support benefits to their employees in the forms of loans um, and, and other access to other financial tools, uh, whether it be, you know, paying for childcare or uh, housing, for example. So there's already a dependency and a risk that's attached. I can understand that one more thing may feel like, you know, a stretch in terms of too much risk. And, and as we know, you know, financial uh, literacy levels are, are low globally. Like, let's let's be honest. I think even there's a, there's a misconception that people who earn a lot of money know how to utilize it effectively. So I think when it comes to investor investments, we've definitely seen, you know, this, this conversation and, and risk aversion around taking on that additional risk. But I think that's where the regulation comes into play to say, you know, let's set the framework that makes sense remove a lot of that risk because it's being governed by the right the right parties um and that's how you kind of create that that evolutionary change i think the other thing as well is if you think about how you know 
people being left to their own devices will access a range of financial instruments, whether they're right or wrong for them. Um, so I think there's already a willingness and accepting the acceptance that people are going to access these services if they want to access them. And I think that that mentality of it being offered on an optional basis rather than a mandatory basis from the employer's perspective, unless governed by re regulation, is kind of the, the, the entry point. The entry point, right. Yeah. So I'm just going to make a statement, right? So I, mm -hmm. I, 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 and uh, again, at the risk of being wrong, and I'm wrong quite often, is, is uh, we have a very young population here, mm -hmm. right? Uh, the vast majority of the people here are either are, uh, um, if I may call them single, right? Yep. Uh, uh, or they are double income, no kids, mm -hmm. right? And, and as you said, life is expensive. Yep. Um, uh, Dubai for me is, you know, it's, Hong Kong meets Las Vegas or New York meets Las Vegas kind mm -hmm. of thing. So, you, you know, the high life is 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 very prevalent here. Yep. You know, there is a blink factor. Uh, my attitude, my, my belief is that a lot of those guys and girls would rather just say, you know something, don't give me this travel allowance, housing allowance, savings allowance, yep. retirement allowance. Just give me hard cash. Yeah. Right. Um, I don't know. I, I definitely know that was prevalent 12 years ago when I was young, mm -hmm. right? And that was my attitude, yep. right? Because I, you know, I was like, hey, I just, you know, I want to take four holidays a year. I'm mm -hmm. in the middle of the world. I, you know, just give me cash, yep. right? Uh, how do you fight that? Like, how do you educate people against it? Because, because you know, in some parts of the world, it's mandatory. Of course. Right? So you have no option. It's an, you know, it's a necessary evil. You've got to sign up to it. you got to. But in a market like here, where it's not, I guess, uh, uh, a it's not mandatory, how do you actually go about educating? Uh, you know, you're competing with a Saturday brunch. Yeah. 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 It, <laughs> which is a very appealing <laughs> and... Uh, and, uh, and yeah. Well, I haven't, been to one, I haven't been to one in a few years, but yes, not when I was say, younger. Yeah. Right, so. yeah. Um, I think... It's difficult to do. I mean, I have a, a principle, a mantra that I use with a team, which is be an effing adult, which means like you're responsible, right? You're responsible for yourself. And ultimately you have to be responsible for the, the things that you do and the outcomes that that, that, that leads to. So I think um, in terms of a product or a way of solutionizing that, it's about giving people an understanding of, yes, like, you know, everybody wants, you don't know, to, to my point, you know, we hadn't lived past 35, you may get hit by a car tomorrow and you do need to be able to take some risk with your money and, and, and enjoy it. Like um, somebody once said to me, uh, a dollar is only worth a dollar if, it's, if you can spend it which I think is a really a really nice way to think about money because it's all well and good saving it, but if you're not around to spend it, what, what good does it really do? So I think you have to you know, find mechanisms for balancing spending and saving. Um, there have been some interesting uh, experiments that have been done in the U US around sort of packaging funds. So you, know, uh, you would basically set a, a very small savings goal um, and then once that savings goal has been met, that money gets locked and then the savings goal starts again. So you, you create this environment of opportunity to save, um, then kind of, I'm going to take that away from you because you've done a great job, you've saved for it. And then you have liquidity over the next amount of saving until it's, until the pot's full and then you, and then you save that again. So I think, you know, it's up to us to build solutions and, and find ways to give people leverage over their assets where they can, I wouldn't say double dip, but you know, you know, if you think about how the wealthy work, they take a lump sum of money that they have, they leverage it against a loan, uh, and then they spend that and try and make more money, right? Mm -hmm. So, so there are there are mechanisms which haven't been explored in the savings world, which I think we can do a better job of, which give people the ability to spend capital, but also give them the opportunity to save. To save, yeah. right? Excellent. Let's come into regulation, right? Yeah. Um, 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 and I think for the sake of everybody on this uh, on this sort of show who's listening in uh, or watching us, uh, explain to us that there's been some regulatory changes or or, or advisory which has come out mm -hmm. right uh, around uh, you know the world in which you operate, yeah. uh, which is positive. Uh, so tell us what what that sort of means and you know how does that sort of help? 
Yeah, so um, again, in terms of my history, I worked for a company called Smart Pension Technology Provider uh, based out of the UK, uh, Global Operations, and they provide the technology for the DIFC JUICE scheme. So the JUICE scheme was set up with the intent of kind of creating an infrastructure for DIFC companies to be able to invest the end of service gratuity. Effectively, the announcement that was made a few weeks ago is that that principle will be extended to the UAE and employers will be given the option and it will be an optional um, thing to begin with the option to invest their end of service gratuity um, in with the in, with the hope and intention of you know making a return on that we all know that the best way to make money is to invest rather than to, to leave in cash unless you're in a high interest rate environment which we currently are um, but yeah the, the the regulation is basically encouraging people to start that process before it then I would imagine becomes a mandatory thing um, and kind of helps embed that culture of saving and planning for the future um, and is that going to open the floodgates as far as competition is concerned Absolutely. I think, you know, I wouldn't say the market's nascent now. You have, you know, uh, insurers like Zurich, Haya, who are, who are operating in this space, um, uh, National Bonds, who, again, you know, very, very public and very loud about their, their intent for this space, which I think is great, right? You need people to lead in this space. Um, and offer solutions that are offered elsewhere. And then it is kind of up to the, the upstarts like us um, who come with institutional experience, but, but innovative technology to be able to kind of try and move things further along as well. So you need that, that dynamic market for, for good, good outcomes for, for individuals. Okay, so, 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 so this is interesting, right? So let, let's, going from regulation, let's talk a little bit about, you know, the competitive environment, the competitive tempo, right? Uh, at the end of the day, you've got 9 million people in this country. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd say, you know, half of that population, um, uh, unfortunately, doesn't make enough money yeah. to be saving in considerable volumes or values. Um, the vast majority of their income, somewhere between 60 to 80 percent, is actually remitted back to the country that they come from. Uh, and obviously, they'll need the 20 to 30 percent to live in uh, in an ever mm -hmm. increasingly expensive environment, right? So, you know, the market sort of shrinks down to about three to four million, which for people like you and me from London, it's maybe a couple of boroughs, yeah. right? Um, I also think, and this is just, again, a view that, that, that if you look at that sort of savings or wealth creation, as you called it, mm -hmm. I think I like that, wealth creation value chain, right? Uh, there were a number of pe people who play in that value chain and the lines are sort of blurring, mm -hmm. right? So, so there are, you know, we're starting to see these embedded saving platforms which are coming around. Actually, I had a early stage startup of, you know, I think about 10 episodes ago. Twig, yeah, yeah, we know, know, know those guys. Right. Um, 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 you know, uh, I've had uh, some of these uh, robo-advisory mm -hmm. platforms, you know, so I had Stash Away here, which, yep. you know, and, uh, 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 and, and some of these sort of online platforms which predominantly offer right now online trading, mm -hmm. which to me is more like gambling than online trading because if people don't know really how to online trade there, you know, yep. the chances are, I personally think you just buy the S&P 500 and go to sleep, right? And I think it's better. <laughs> Pretty good, man. Uh, yeah, well, that's what I've, you know, that's what I've done all my life. I'm, I'm, as I said, I'm just not smart enough to beat the market. Yes, I have taken certain exposure. You know, I, I, I believe in about half a dozen to a dozen companies where I took a position I and mean, I've kept the position and my view here is I'll stay in. And yes, I do invest in Bitcoin because yeah. my view is that's kind of what gives me the kicks because, mm -hmm. you know, that's the only volatility that I really actually see everything else sort of yep. moves around 10 or 5%. But with Bitcoin, you can have a 100% shift up and down. In any case, the problem, <laughs> the question I was trying to get to in this very long-winded way was the lines are actually blurring. So a lot of people who you might actually see as peers and partners sure. are uh, somehow directly or indirectly competing with you, right? Uh, in a very limited market, uh, you know, three to four million people, mm -hmm. uh, how does that play out in terms of economics, uh, of the attractiveness of the size of the business you can build? Yeah, so again, I think there are a few different things to consider here. So if I look at the traditional direct consumer uh, providers, they they do have a limited market specifically because they, they don't have extendability in terms of their product offering and brand. So what works in this market doesn't translate in or is very difficult to translate into other markets because typically there are other providers in those markets that operate. Um, also, the direct consumer channel is difficult to activate and maximize because 
again, there's an very act, expensive. Yeah, exactly. There's an active choice that has to be made by me as a consumer to use your product over the several other products that are, that are in the market. So I think whilst there's huge value in what they offer, I think it's really hard to kind of expand the value and uh, scale that they would want to want to achieve. With what we do, because it's, again, if I look at the, the difference in the consistency across markets, we have an extendable product because it happens around the world. Yeah. So you're and a B2B infrastructure player exactly, or a platform. Yeah. Yeah, okay. so, so our opportunity is to take what we do here and extend, extend it beyond the UAE into the other MENA regions uh, and GCC countries. So I think the, the difference, as I see it, is kind of twofold. One is there is this extendable opportunity, extendable brands. And the other thing is that we're not an active choice for, we don't have to be an active choice for an individual because we're going through the, the employer. Mm -hmm. So you know, if we, if we rely on regulation or build a really, really good product, then you know the the employer wants to use it there's an incentive and again if you think about how typically these things work if you offer some form of matching as an employer even if it's one percent of salary even if it's 100 dirham if you as an employee contribute 100 dirham that's 100 percent return on your money so so you don't you can't see that that return from a from a direct consumer offering unless it's bitcoin like you say where yeah, you, well, you might you might see 100 percent, but you might but see 100 yeah, no, yeah, yeah so, exactly so, so um uh, let's not advise anybody to <laughs> buy no bitcoins advice, yeah. this is not yeah but it's um <laughs> it's it's more advantageous if it's structured and set up in the right way so absolutely they are competitors in terms of you know there is only one dollar that can be saved or invested um but I feel like there are more incentives attached to what we're doing. And also, we, like I said, we can create um, a way of creating portability. And I think that's the most important thing for us and from, from speaking to customers again, you know, the population here is 90% expatriate. They, even if they want to retire, even if they do end up retiring here, they're not thinking about retiring here today. They're always thinking about home or, or the next place that they want to go to. So giving them access to those funds and not giving them any risk attached to that. So knowing that they can they can take those funds with them, um, they can access them in different currencies. They aren't things that the direct consumer uh, solutions here are necessarily thinking about. Okay, so uh, uh, I've got I've got a question, but let me ask you. So so deconstruct this for me, right? You mentioned portability. Mm -hmm. So what are the four or five key building blocks of building a successful employee benefit platform? So you know, I, what are the must-haves and you know, what are the sort of, I may say, the, the you know, the, the icing on the cake? Yes, I think it's, uh, we were talking about this yesterday uh, in the office, and, and it's a combination of vitamins and painkillers, right? So there, there need to be nice to haves in there that people just expect, and then there needs to be things actually materially uh, solve a problem for, for people. So, so which what, one is the painkiller? Is the nice to have? The painkiller is, is, the, is the need to have, like the, okay. the, the burning <laughs> problem. Um, so in, in terms of the core, the core products that you need, again, I think financially focused. Um, education, I think, is a, is a key component. And delivering that, again, uh, in kind of a pro progressive disclosure way. The way I think about this is like layers of an onion. You want to start super simple, but then give people the, the super complex detailed stuff if they want to access that. So I think education is incredibly important. The ability to save and invest, as we know, like, you know, as we said, like that's the way to create wealth is by investing and getting a greater return over time. Uh, I think portability through access is incredibly important. And like I said, I think that boils down to availability in the currencies that you want to, because as soon as you have to, you know, as soon as you're in the UK, as soon as you're in uh, India and in Australia, you don't want to be spending, you know, spending in Durham or, or, or having a, a, a fee that's, that's attached to, to moving your money. So again, having access on demand, I think is really important. And then making it more transactional. Uh, one of the opportunities that I see, which is kind of counter to, to typical uh, employee benefits or, or, or retirement savings provisions, is giving people more access to their funds and being able to utilize them uh, earlier. So absolutely, people do need to save. They need to build wealth, but sometimes you have to spend to, to build, right? So you can't always or often double dip, you know, mm -hmm. if, you're, if, you're, if you want to buy a house and you, you know, you're, you're thinking of buying a house or saving for your future, the immediate need is going to be more important than the, than the future need. Uh, so how do we create solutions around, you know, providing access in a meaningful way that still gives people the opportunity to save? So I think fundamentally it's, financial products that help people grow their wealth, education uh, and information that helps support them in making informed decisions, and then a collaboration of you know, access and, and 
literal portability of those mm -hmm. funds. I think one of the things, again, my CTO and I were talking about this a few weeks ago, um, Chase, JP Morgan's Chase mm -hmm. Bank in the UK have done incredibly well is they have a card and they have a um, an interest bearing account that, that sits underneath it. And, and the dynamic between those two things is really important because, you know, if you're if you have money in a, in a current account today, you're not making any money on that. It's, it's just sitting there and people typically hold money in cash. But if you give that transactional um, accessibility to people and they're making a return on their on their funds, then all of a sudden that becomes a really interesting dynamic. It does. It does. No, I think they're all very sensible questions. So yeah. let me let me sort of come back to Orem, right? Mm -hmm. I, I'm very keen to hear about, you know, uh, the Orem journey and, and so on and so forth. But I'm going to use this this question, which hopefully sort of bridges the gap. Right. So uh, I, I am fundamentally sold on the concept of, you know, B2B platforms mm -hmm. versus B2C business. I, I actually don't like retailing, but yeah. that's me, right? Uh, if I had, if I have to invest a dollar, I'll invest a dollar in a riskier B2B infrastructure platform play versus a, a more sort of, if I may say, a more qualified B2C player, because I, mm -hmm. I personally think that the, the whole B2C game is incredibly tricky. It's expensive. Uh, consumer behavior changes very rapidly. There are too many adjacencies. Competition gets interesting. If I buy into everything that you just said, maybe mm -hmm. five or six minutes ago, in terms of you know the B2B play versus the B2C play, right? And I, I agree with everything you you said. I suspect, and I'm actually already seeing that a number of players, not just in your sector but other sectors, are actually now pivoting to that B2B model, right? Yeah. Um, Twig is a very interesting example. So I, I, when I first met the Twig team, they were actually a B two C platform. You might not. Be yeah, yeah, no, yeah. I, I, right. I mean, I'm one of those people that downloads every app right. that I see. So they still so have the B two C play, right? Because they use that as more in terms of. And I'm sorry, I'm speaking on behalf of them, so apologies if I got this wrong. But I think it gives them that sort of direct interaction with the consumers to understand consumer behavior. They can pilot a few new products. But they're now quite focused on being a B2B platform, which mm -hmm. they can go and embed with a bunch of embedders, right? Whether it's roundups or savings or goal-based, whatever the hack is, mm -hmm. right? Now, you're going to actually have more competition coming, right? Now, let me overlay that and make it slightly more complex. If you're going to go B2B in an environment where employment is fairly concentrated because yeah. there are some very, very large employers, right? Um, so in some parts of the world, the micro small businesses have about nearly 80 to 90% of the population working. Mm -hmm. I think here the percentage is about 60 to 70%. Yeah. I could be wrong, right? So, right? so there's a little bit more concentration of of, uh, of employment and a large percentage of that are sort of government, quasi-government institution. So there is, a, you know, there is a race to win very quickly. And a lot of these relationships then become multi-year lock-ins, mm -hmm. right? Uh, because, you know, if you're going to get a large corporate with, let's say, 20,000 employers, employees to sign your platform on, they're not going to switch off in three months time. They can, yeah. but there's a certain amount of pain everybody has to go through, processes have to be defined, improve, internal approvals, mm -hmm. whatever else, right? So there's, there's, there's sort of, you know, there's, there's a, I don't want to call it a gold rush, but let's assume there is some sort of a gold rush because there's only a finite number of people. With that sort of dynamic in the market, what's setting you guys apart? So again, I think there are a few things. So I think typical or traditional B2B players, so your insurers, they focus very much on the sale to the business. So all of their effort, all of their energy, all of the experience goes into that sale to the business. When ironically, it's not the, the business of the purchaser of the product, but they're not the user of the product. Mm -hmm. So the experience for the end consumer is poor and therefore there's low levels of engagement. It's typically what we see in pension industry around the world. Um, the experience lags. I mean, even behind banking by like ten years, fifteen mm -hmm. years, which is like you're, you're right. The I, banking both my pensions yeah. in the UK. Exactly. Poor I, I can never ever get to know what the value of that pension is like. It's like yeah. a nightmare. Exactly. So, yeah. and, and there's there's value in that for them because they don't want you thinking about it. They just want to keep the assets, make money off of you, and, and everything else. 
from a direct consumer perspective, obviously the focus is different. The focus is on the individual and pivoting to a B2B to C model means that you don't, you're not equipped to do that B2B piece. You don't understand how the minds of the, of the purchaser is different. And maybe you will heavily lean on the experience that you have from an application. Um, but that isn't going to be the thing that to your point earlier, how do you manage the risk that the, the employer has to take on? How do you manage the processes that they have? Um, you know, integrations with payroll, all of the you know, HR processes, et cetera. So you have these kind of two divergent worlds where one is very focused on the buyer, the other one is very focused on the user. And I think the first advantage that we have is we're focusing on both of those things because that's that's what you should do, right? Like you, you're serving yeah, you're right. two customers. So, yeah. so serve two customers, don't serve one. I think the other advantage that we have um, is, is you know, we're backed by Further Ventures. Uh, and for anybody who isn't aware of Further Ventures, you know, this, this uh, venture studio was spun out of ADQ. Mm -hmm. um, with that, as we know, within the region, there's a, you know, the, the strength of relationships and also the value that ADQ brings um, is, is what I think gives us a additional value and, and benefit, not only from a relationship perspective, but also in terms of access to credibility yeah, brand yeah exactly so you know we don't take that lightly i, I mentioned before we're, we're building an institution with a with a startup mentality so we want you know we're, we're building a corporation we're not we're not just a startup who's here for a few years to do something shiny um, and break everything we're here to break the way that things are done but deliver it in in a way that is long-standing and i think you know the combination of that startup mentality the the relationships and and kind of um leverage that we have and we can use from from those those beginnings is is incredibly valuable to us and differentiated no interesting and i, I do agree i think a lot of those are important building blocks um I, and i think you know they, they can accelerate your speed to market Absolutely. and accelerate your your i guess your sales cycle because mm -hmm. that's i guess in any p2p business that tends to be a challenge then if those things can help then that you know great that that, that would be a huge benefit to you so michael let me sort of go back in time, right? I should have asked this question 30 minutes ago when we started, right? Where are we in the journey? So just, just break it down. When, mm -hmm. when were you guys founded or formed out of the Venture Studio? Uh, uh, I don't know if you're disclosing how much have you raised so far, how big are you as an organization? So, so give, give us a bit of sort of, you know, bring Orem to life for us. Yeah, sure. So um, we started out in September 2022. Um, we also oh, you not yet a year just well, over just a year, year just over a year oh, so yeah. happy birthday <laughs> thank you very much and it's been uh, it's been an interesting year because I think as I said when we started out we were very much focused on how do we you know solve for this end of service benefit problem that's that's going to come in the UAE um, and one of the things that kind of stopped us being able to do that sooner is regulation so uh, sorry regulation licensing so we've been going through a licensing process for for basically the entirety of that year um it's been frustrating but also incredibly helpful and useful for us because it shows two things one is that the uae and and specifically adgm are taking this seriously in terms of ensuring that you know people aren't just slipping through the net and they're not just letting anybody have a crack at this opportunity. Um, but it's also going to give us more time to speak to customers. And I think that's kind of been the most valuable thing for us is understanding how employers want to be served and how their employees want to be served. So the past year for us has been building a product. We now have a product that is, I would say, highly differentiated to anything else that's in the market, both from a an employer perspective, um, the services that we offer, the automation that, that sits within the platform. We've deliberately designed it to be light touch from their perspective, um, integrations where possible. And then from the employee experience, again, we, we've thought about things from the ground up rather than just delivering. Here's some information that you're never going to look at. We want our customers to kind of think about engaging with our app on a daily basis rather than once a month. So um, again, so going back a few steps, the team now is, 15 people mm -hmm. um so you know pretty decent size for for a young company yeah. and we will continue to grow that but that again talks to the fact that we're looking to create an institution rather than just be a scrappy startup where everybody is doing multiple things um we're heavily uh, products and technology focused at the moment because again you have to create that foundation you have to understand what problem you're solving before you then uh, sort of lean into the, the the business side and we're now starting to scale that up um 
we have some great investors. So Further Ventures, as I mentioned, uh, Miasa Partners. So um, they, I'm not sure if you're familiar with those guys, but uh, Nabil Al-Maskari, a family office out of Abu Dhabi. Uh, he, he's, he and a few others have set up Miasa Partners, uh, it's kind of an investment fund. Mm-hmm. Um, and they, they are also uh, investors in us. In terms of our raise, so we've raised four million to date. We're kind of in the process of raising additional funds to kind of support this growth. Um, And we are also in conversations with a number of multinational organizations. So for us, this isn't just a UAE based problem. We want to solve here first because we think it's very important. And we also think it's a representative of the future future shape of many uh, international markets, especially in terms of like the expatriate population. So um, it's been an adventurous year. It's been, uh, as every a startup <laughs> thinks and feels and experience, it's been a trying year, but but all for the good. So, you know, these are these are lessons that we needed to learn. And, and if anything, I think you know the pace for us in terms of having to go through these you know, regulatory scrutiny, having to spend time thinking about the product that we're building rather than just launching, has been incredibly helpful. And so, how far down the product build are you now? Yes, yeah, so we have a functioning app. We have a fun- functioning employer uh, portal. Um, and we, how, how many deployments do you have yet? So we, because of because of licensing, we don't. We're not transacting with anybody's money. We have several clients who have signed up already okay. and, and do, uh, you know preparing to pilot. So um, so yeah, we're, we're in a good position in terms of you know pipeline. Um, and now it's by execution. Uh, so, like, uh, within the next few weeks, we'll have our license, and, and then it's kind of oh, everything that's great. Going. Congratulations for that too. How did Michael and Further Ventures come together? So interesting. So um, it was the so so again. For in terms of my background, I worked on uh, the platform that that uh, powers Jews. Okay. Um, they understood the problem space, as in further ventures understood so the problem space and the, and the regulation that was to come, and were kind of looking for somebody who they could fund, who has the experience and, and understanding of this problem space, and can kind of take that opportunity and funding and turn it into something meaningful. So um, they reached out to me. Uh, I was I'd actually decided for a little while that I was moving out of the retirement and investment space and into crypto, uh, working for, uh, it's actually, uh, it was um, uh, block, more blockchain, it was crypto, but but specifically decentralized um, compute, which is a really interesting problem, especially given now the AI is you know, uh, eating up all of, all yeah. of the compute. Um, but yes, yeah, so I had moved away because I kind of wanted a different mental problem. This is something that I've always been passionate about and, and kind of had thought about, you know, do I just go go and try and get some funding uh, and solve this problem for myself? I thought about you know the UK. I thought about Australia. Both of those markets are heavily saturated. You know, incredibly incumbent and uh, very difficult to crack. But I knew the growing opportunity here in the Middle East. So it was kind of like a match made in heaven in terms of you know the funding, the opportunity, having a vision for what product needed to to solve this pro- problem, not just for for the UAE as I said, but could also potentially penetrate other markets. So. Uh, and, and you can yeah. bring blockchain into the mix. Don't worry about it. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so you, 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 you can still make sure that, you know, uh, I'm sure. And, and, and uh, I guess digital currencies and assets will have a role to play on yeah. it, too. So, uh, you know, I'm conscious of time, right? So you, you've mentioned this word. We're trying to build an institution, mm-hmm. right? Help me. What does that mean? So again, there's probably negative connotations when it comes to the word institution, but what I mean when I say institution is people, uh, an organization that takes governance, risk, and management of people's funds seriously. This isn't like, you know, uh, back of a napkin, you know, that, that type of, there's, there's, you know, two people who are my cousins who are- And that's essential because if you're going to convince a large organization that, you know- uh, Exactly. uh, I don't think they care about whether your genes are scrappy or not, but I think that they do care about whether you are going to create a nightmare for them or not. Completely. And, and I think, you know, we operate a trust structure. So just just very quickly, Please. it's a legal structure, which, mean, which means that even if we go out of business, your assets are protected. Agreed. So, Agreed. so that's a great starting point for us. Um, but like I said, we need the foundations that can support delivering that in a meaningful and uh, efficient way but also gives security and, and removes the risk uh, of us managing those funds. So 
when you're when you're dealing with people's money, you don't want somebody who's like a you know a five man team who have no exposure to financial risk, have no expense exposure to um, asset management governance. Um, you know, again, like I'm I'm a trustee, still an active trustee for NatWest Bank in the UK for their pension scheme. So, you know, I've worn many hats in this space. Still wear many hats. I understand it, and and I know the importance of making sure that you're you know ticking all of the relevant boxes, not just from like an external perspective uh, perception perspective, but also from an internal you know, controls and, and governance perspective. So that's what I mean when I say institution. Right, I mean, we you. want to do things properly. No, and I, and I, and I, I think that's necessary with what yeah. you're doing, right? I'm cognizant of time. Um, um, uh, you, you run a startup, you have 15 people. I think you <laughs> want to get on to work rather than just be sitting and chatting with me. But last question, right? Um, so I have this, um, uh, I use this term, the point of departure and point of arrival. And, and I believe in, in a business you have several points of arrival, right? Yep. Uh, we've talked a lot about the point of departure, right? Uh, in terms of how you guys are set up, you know, further ventures, your own experience, mm -hmm. right? So uh, I'm gonna put you on the spot. Uh, your point of arrival in let's say three to four years time, mm -hmm. what's kind of the vision right now with Orem? Like, so talk to me in terms of scale, size, number of markets you're operating at, you know, AUM, what, give me some feel of what, what you know, what sort of institution are you building? Yeah, so as you yeah. said, I mean, let's be completely frank, the announcement of regulation here or incoming regulation is going to create a land grab. So what we want to do is be the preeminent player in the market. We want to be, you know, appreciating that there are large incumbents who already have done this for many years, but um, with that doesn't come necessarily a good experience. So we want to be the incumbent player in the UAE. As I said, we're also having conversations outside of the UAE to kind of solve for this is a this is a problem that the large uh, multinationals have is that UAE is a really good example. They will have regional offices, uh, and if they want consistent benefits across those offices, it's really difficult for them to do. So we want to be able to serve those large multinational businesses, large corporations, um, start showing some success in multiple markets, and and really stealing some some uh, some of the pie from from the incumbents who have just you know to be honest got a little bit fat and lazy and and just you know uh using inertia as a, as a reason to continue to make money so three years time i would say decent decent share if not the leading provider in the uae um and showing success in a few other markets as few well other markets yeah right michael i want to thank you uh, well, best of luck. I think, you know, Thank you. land grab, as they say, is, uh, <laughs> is, is, is an interesting term. Uh, I, I guess lots of sleepless nights ahead of you. Is uh, it showing? Uh, well, no, no, no. <laughs> man, man, you're talking to a guy who's, who's in, who, who suffers from insomnia. So yeah. I figured out I have some good creams I can recommend Perfect. you, which you can I'm use, uh, uh, you know, to, to take the puffiness from under your eye, <laughs> eyes. But no, no, it's very interesting. You know, I learned a lot. I, I think it's a topic which, uh, so uh, you might not be aware, but I actually worked for AXA for five years. Okay, yeah. uh, and I used to run uh, their strategy in the UK. Mm -hmm. And I worked across life, uh, general, and health. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, uh, I don't talk about it uh, because you <laughs> dirty know, secret. Uh, well, yeah, well, you know, it's insurance. You yeah. know. Uh, no, no, nothing against insurance. And please, all you insurance guys, I, I, I love you to bits. Uh, uh, but, but it, it was a topic which, to be honest, living in the UK was just very much, uh, you know, it's kind of elementary, right? Mm -hmm. Like you just you get into these things and, and you know, you sign up to the pension schemes that, yeah. that are there. And, and you know, the fact that everybody matches to a certain extent, you know, it's 100% return on investment, why wouldn't it make sense? Um, social welfare and the social state is very dominant in the way the ideology of the entire, so I guess the culture of the nation is, so you, you kind of just fall in place, right? And yeah, you just sure. follow out. You came back here and I do remember when I first arrived here and I've been here, as I said, 13, 14 years, we didn't have that mechanism. And I was still working for that 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 organization that I used to work for the UK because I actually transferred, mm -hmm. right? And and when they didn't offer me that, I, I kind of found it strange. Yeah. But then at the same time, I was living in Dubai and I was like, hold on, I'd rather just take the cash, yeah, right? Exactly. Tax let's, free just, and, yeah. just, let's just live it up. And, yeah. and maybe you're correct. Maybe I wasn't thinking about living beyond 35, although I was close to about mm -hmm. 31 when I was there. So, uh, but you're right. I was kind of living in the moment and, you know, uh, there was more ways than one that you could spend money in Dubai and there was a sense of exploration. So so I, I do think you're solving a, 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 a much needed, uh, well, you're solving for a much uh, required 
thing here. I do think a lot of it is latent. Mm -hmm. uh, I also do think that you have this very interesting dynamic that your competition is uh, sort of in stealth because a lot of people are doing this sort of stuff. They're just doing it back in their so-called home country. That's right, yeah. Uh, and which is different than most other parts of the world. But, mm -hmm. you know, it's interesting that there are 270 million expats in the world. That's that's a learning. You know, it's it's it, it sort of triggered a few thoughts in terms of what, uh, what I'm doing. Uh, well, I hope, uh, you know, the employers or the, or the individuals who are going to listen, I'm sure there's, you know, there's, there's quite a few employers out there. Mm -hmm. uh, so guys, if Michael comes knocking on your door, <laughs> uh, do say hello to him. Uh, uh, as he said, he is building an institution. I'm aware of further ventures. Everybody in this part of the world is aware of ADQ. So I think he brings all that sort of credibility behind it. Uh, I think uh, uh, all I can say is best of luck. Thank you. Uh, and uh, maybe in a year or two years time, uh, if this show is still going on, you know, we'll, <laughs> maybe we'll have you back and, uh, you know, I'll, I'll ask where else have you ventured and how big you are. So, uh, well, best of luck to your team and thank you for coming. Thank you very much for having me. Right. So everybody, that was Michael Watkins. Uh, he is founder and CEO of Orem, uh, which is an employee benefit platform. But, but, you know, after the last 45 minutes that we've spoken, it is a lot more than just an employee benefit uh, platform. It's more of a wealth creation sort of mechanism. Uh, and what I like was that he, he, he acknowledged that he has two customers because I think a lot of people forget in these B2B to C or B2B to E propositions that there is the B in the middle, which actually arguably could be a more important customer, at least in the short term, because you've got to get them to move along with you. But with that, I'll say goodbye um, and, uh, you know, wish Orem the very best. Bye. <laughs>